We will now describe the technical approach to the transforaminal epidural injection. In this case, medication is delivered into the anterior epidural space via the neural foramen. The approach typically enters the epidural space via the superior one-third of the neural foramen, described as the safe triangle. This is bounded medially by the nerve root, superiorly by the transverse process, and anteriorly by the vertebral body. Note here on the right, the initial target at the beginning of a transferminal will be the 6 o'clock position uh, of the pedicle at the intended level to be injected. Uh, the target will uh, remain the same throughout multiple components of the injection. A Quingy type needle is typically used in a transferminal approach. It differs from a Twee type in that it has a straight cutting edge increasing its cutting action. Size selection is similar to that in a TUI type with additional considerations given to the craniocaudal angulation and obliquity required to reach the target. For example, a transforaminal epidural requiring an increased craniocaudal approach may increase the distance to the target thereby may require a longer length needle. Put on the left an anterior posterior view of the L4 level noting the 6 o'clock position of the pedicle. On the right, the initial starting point at the same level, oblique to approximately 25 to 35 degrees. This radiopaque marker shows the starting point for a left L4 transrenal epidural. Once the target is localized, uh, local anesthetic, such as 1% lidocaine, is utilized to anesthetize the skin and subcutaneous tissues. Special care is taken to anesthetize the track that the needle is expected to take. Once the skin is adequately anesthetized, a quinky type needle is then inserted. Note that with a quinky type needle, the cutting edge is much sharper. In the case of this needle noted on the right, the needle tip is given an acute bend by the operator to enhance maneuverability. The procedure begins with the use of intermittent fluoroscopy. The needle is advanced uh, slowly remaining under the 6 o'clock position of the pedicle in the superior one-third of the neural foramen. Once the transverse process is encountered by a hard resistance, the view will be changed to the anterior posterior view to assess additional depth within the foramen. The anterior to posterior view, note the needle, remains under the pedicle. This is slowly advanced with intermittent fluoroscopy. The target, once again, in this case, is the 6 o'clock position of the pedicle. When this position is reached, the use of intermittent and live fluoroscopy and radiopaque contrast is utilized. Radiopaque contrast is used to verify appropriate epidural placement and to rule out any vascular injection. Once appropriate placement is verified, medication is administered and the needle is removed. The is then taken to recovery with a post-procedure neurological assessment prior to discharge. The approach, positioning, and equipment to the caudal epidural steroid injection is similar to that of the interlaminar approach and will be described here. To perform the caudal epidural steroid injection, the patient is positioned prone on the fluoroscopic table. It may help to straighten the lumbar curve by placing a small pillow or roll under the patient's lower abdomen. A wide area of the patient's lower back and buttocks specifically the gluteal cleft is prepped with povidone iodine and draped in sterile fashion. Sterile gauze should be placed in the mid-gluteal cleft below the expected needle entry point for increased sterility. The caudal epidural space is approached via the sacral hiatus. Even with the use of fluoroscopy, this procedure may require manual identification of the sacral cornu. The sacral cornu are located on either side of the sacral hiatus. Fluoroscopic imaging will often reveal an opaque inverted U-shaped landmark as the entry to the sacral hiatus. After the sacral hiatus has been located, 1% lidocaine is used to infiltrate the skin and subcutaneous tissue. A 20-gauge TUI epidural needle is advanced cephalad towards the sacral hiatus. It is common for the needle tip to contact the periosteum of the sacral canal. If this occurs, the needle is withdrawn slightly in advance at a different and often 
more shallow angle. Initially, resistance is felt as the needle enters the sacrococcygeal ligament, followed by a loss of resistance as the needle enters the caudal epidural space. At this point, the angle of the needle is lowered, and the needle is advanced one half to one centimeter into the epidural space. It is important to gently aspirate for the presence of blood or CSF before injecting any medication into the epidural space. Confirmation of proper position within the caudal epidural space requires the use of one to three milliliters of contrast agent. Ease of injection and spread of the agent in a cranial direction often confirms proper needle placement. After the procedure has been performed, the patient is cleaned and a band-aid is placed over the puncture site. This can be removed in several hours. No restrictions to activity are typically required. Patients will remain in recovery from 30 to 60 minutes with additional time given if any neurological signs or symptoms are noted on post-procedure neurological exam. In most cases, the patient can drive themselves home provided no neurological findings are present post-procedure. Resumption of medications including blood thinning agents is advised and the patients may continue analgesics for several days until post-procedure related soreness resolves. There is uh, adequate data to support the short-term efficacy of a lumbar epidural steroid injection for uh, short-term pain relief. There is limited data suggesting that the transfemoral epidural may be somewhat more efficacious however uh, the data is limited in these cases. Minor complications uh, typically can involve uh, vasovagal response, injection site soreness, as well as uh, transient uh, weakness associated with anesthetic, as well as local infection. Major complications are relatively rare and largely include uh, the risk of intravascular injection and vascular injury, uh, nerve root injury, and dural puncture. A systematic review by Manchi County et al. found strong evidence for short-term efficacy from multiple high-quality trials and moderate evidence for long-term efficacy from at least one high-quality trial. Short-term response was defined as less than six months with long-term responses defined as greater than six months. Evidence for efficacy was found for caudal, interlaminar, and transframinal epidural injections at managing lumbar disc herniation pain and functional improvement. There is uh, limited and conflicting data regarding the rates of these major complications such as vascular injuries and dural puncture. However, it appears that the rate of vascular injury went higher for a transframinal compared to an interlaminar. This is likely due to the anatomy and the presence of a radicular artery within the neural foramen. However, these complications are still considered fairly low. There are several types of formulations of steroids used for a typical steroid injection. These are typically categorized by the size of the steroid particles or the particulation. Uh, particulate steroids are typically depot forms such as depomedrol, while other non-particulate formulations are available. However, the data is limited, suggesting that depot forms of steroids appear to be more efficacious. In most cases, injections where there is a higher risk of an intravascular injection, non-particulate steroids are recommended. In summary, the following key points are important to uh, review in the case of epidural injections. Uh, epidural injections are effective for the short-term management of pain associated with the lumbar radiculopathy. There may be a slight increase in effectiveness of a transferanal uh, versus an interlaminar, although the data is somewhat limited. There does not appear to be any evidence to support the use of a series of injections. Therefore, the approach and the frequency of injections should be determined on a case-by-case -case basis. Applications remain relatively rare. There may be a slight increase in risk of vascular injections for a transferanal versus an interlaminar, and a slight increase of dural puncture with an interlaminar epidural versus a transferaminal. However, once again, these risks remain low. There is limited and uh, slightly underpowered data uh, suggesting that depot formulation of steroids may have an advantage over non-depot forms. However, in the case 
of injections that may involve higher risk of vascular injection, non-particular steroids are recommended.